So, okay, January 1st, 1863, Lincoln issues, as promised, as threatened, the Emancipation Proclamation, which you can read, and I urge you to do so, in the Janap book. One of the least well understood documents, key documents of American history. If you think that Lincoln freed all the slaves with a stroke of his pen, no, he did not. The Emancipation Proclamation, there were four million slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation does not apply to the border states because they're in the Union. This is directed at the Confederacy. There are four border states with half a million slaves. They are not affected by the Emancipation Proclamation. Moreover, Lincoln exempts certain parts of the South, these hatched areas from Virginia down, that's where the Emancipation Proclamation applies. It does not apply to Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware. It does not apply to West Virginia, which is coming in as a free state soon. It does not apply to Tennessee. Lincoln exempts Tennessee at the request of governor, military governor Andrew Johnson. After capturing Nashville, a pro-union government had set up, and Lincoln exempts Tennessee. He exempts southern Louisiana down here. He exempts a few counties in eastern Virginia. The argument there is areas under Union control no longer are in rebellion, and this is an act against the rebellion. So there are little areas, if you add them up, there may be another couple of hundred thousand slaves in areas exempted in the South. So all told, about three quarters of a million slaves are not affected by the Emancipation Proclamation. But by the same token, something like 3.2 million are declared free on January 1st, 1863. This is the largest emancipation in world history on one day. Never before or since had so many slaves been declared free at one moment. Now, of course, there were those who said, well, it doesn't mean anything because you're only, you're only, um, declaring them free in areas where it cannot be enforced, right? The London Times said this is like a papal bull, a papal proclamation against a comet. Some pope long ago had issued a proclamation telling a comet to go away, and it didn't. <laughs> in other words, it's outside of your jurisdiction. This is outside the jurisdiction. So yes, on the day it was issued, it did not free many slaves. However, it's not fair to say, as you sometimes read, that it didn't free anybody. For example, it applied to the Sea Islands, where the Union Army was in control, but Lincoln did not exempt them. So those slaves, which is 10, 20,000 at least, were free as of January 1st. And there were other areas of eastern um, uh, Arkansas, etc. So Lincoln carefully decided which areas he wanted to exempt and which he didn't. A couple of th points in relation to this. One is, whatever the limits, this was, as they called it, a day of jubilee among African Americans. All over the country, black people, whether in the South, if they could, certainly in Union-occupied South, in the North, gathered in churches and other meetings to kind of celebrate the day of jubilee, the day of, of emancipation. Where they could, they had parades, processions, um, that sort of thing. Why? Why? If, if nothing, if this didn't mean anything, why? Because they understood that if slavery dies in Mississippi or in South Carolina, it's not going to survive very long in Kentucky and Tennessee. That this is the death knell of slavery. It is not the end of slavery. No, slavery doesn't end. Interestingly enough, the proclamation frees individuals, right? It frees people. It does not abolish the institution of slavery. The laws of slavery remain on the books, right? It frees slaves. But to get rid of slavery, you need either to repeal those laws or eventually to have a constitutional amendment. This is why the 13th Amendment will become necessary, as we will see to put into the Constitution the abrogation of all those laws which establish and protect the institution of slavery. So it is a step, it is a step, it is the key step, it is a step, it is not the end of the question of, of slavery. 
What gives the president the right to declare 3.2 million people free? Well, Lincoln says very clearly, this is under the war power of the Constitution. As commander in chief, he is issuing it as commander in chief of the army, okay? That's where the authority comes from. It is a military measure. If you read it, you may be disappointed. It is boring. Military orders are boring. It does not have ringing language like the, it doesn't have immortal language like the Declaration of Independence about the rights of mankind, right? The natural, no, there's nothing like that. Only at the very end, the very last minute in the cabinet, Chase says to Lincoln, you should put something moral in here. <laughs> so Lincoln, the very last sentence you will see, he says this, this uh, act, I don't know the exact words, you know, uh, issued under military necessity and believed to be an act of justice. Believed to be an act of justice. That's the only moral sentiment in the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, among other things, Lincoln is a lawyer and a very good lawyer. And he is worried that if you base it on anything other than military necessity, it will not stand up in court. Now, how important that factor was, I don't know. Some people say, always oh, afraid the Supreme Court will declare it unconstitutional. Frankly, I don't believe it. The Supreme Court would have been lunatic to declare the Emancipation Proclamation unconstitutional, especially with Chief Justice Taney still, until he dies at the end of 1864, still the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. If they had done that, Congress would have just abolished the Supreme Court, <laughs> which it can under the Constitution, and just create another Supreme Court. That would be perfectly constitutional. But I think Lincoln didn't want long litigation about this in state courts, in federal courts. Uh, so, he thought military, the war power, was the strongest constitutional grounding for this measure. The being a military act, which is what it was, to help win the war, it requires Union victory to be implemented. In other words, if the, it makes the Union army an agent of emancipation. Wherever the Union army goes now, part of its task is to protect the freedom of these people that Lincoln has declared to be free. But it requires victories to do that. If the Confederacy had won the war, which was eminently possible, slavery would have lasted a long, long time. No question about it. And the Emancipation Proclamation would not have, would not have uh, had that much effect. I mean, some slaves would have remained free, but that happened in the American Revolution. A lot of slaves became free in the American Revolution, but slavery didn't end. It continued and it grew. So it required Union victory for this to become effectual. But what's really important here is what is, well, among many other things, is that the proclamation com differs completely from Lincoln's previous policies. It is immediate not gradual, right? Takes effect right away. There is nothing in it about compensation. No compensation anymore. These people are just free. And there's nothing in it about colonization. Lincoln, after the Emancipation Proclamation, says nothing publicly about colonization. Now, there are people doing interesting research which has revealed that even after this, some parts of the government are promoting little plans of colonization. There's a negotiating going on with the Danish West Indies, you know, what are now the Virgin Islands of the U.S., St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. John. They belong to Denmark then, and there's a negotiation to maybe settle some freed slaves in the Danish uh, Virgin Islands. So the idea is not completely dead, but what's important is it is no longer part of a plan of emancipation. There's a new plan of emancipation, and that is general emancipation by military order. And you don't need colonization for that, and you don't need gradualism, and you don't need compensation, because all of those things had been efforts to gain the consent of slave owners, right? To get slave owners to agree, you offered all these sweeteners. But now, forget it. It doesn't matter what slave owners say. This is the policy of the Union. They have dropped the idea of getting slave owner consent, and therefore those other aspects of the policy are no longer central.
As to no compensation, Charles and Mary Beard called the Emancipation Proclamation the greatest act, the most stu stupendous act, he says, of sequestration, that is confiscating property, in the history of Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence. That's something. The largest concentration of property in the United States is just liquidated, abrogated, with no monetary compensation. They didn't even do this in the French Revolution. I don't know if they did in the Russian Revolution. This is one of the most radical acts against property in human history. It just abrogates a gigantic amount of property that is recognized by law with no compensation whatsoever. So it's, it's a, pretty dramatic, a pretty dramatic action. Um, it's also worth looking at as how Lincoln addresses the freed people directly in the proclamation. He says to them, he says, I urge you to refrain from violence. A lot of people said, you free the slaves, they're going to rise up and massacre all the white people, Haiti, etc. He says, I urge you to refrain from violence. But then he adds, except in necessary self-defense. Isn't that interesting? He didn't have to say in that. They have a right to defend this freedom even by violence, if necessary. He's not cowed by the, the chorus of, of warnings of these slaves massacring their owners. And then he says, and this is the opposite of colonization, I urge you to go to work here in the United States. Go to work for reasonable wages. I, as I said, you study Lincoln, you become very, it's very remarkable, his, his use of language. Lincoln is a very, very careful writer. Every word is there for a reason. Why didn't he just say, go to work for wages? Nobody would have complained. But no, he says, go to work for reasonable wages. They don't have to just accept any wage that is offered to them. That word reasonable is so interesting in the Emancipation Proclamation. In other words, he's treating slaves as free people with their own will, with their own volition, who, have to, who are now going to start making decisions for themselves, how to defend their freedom, what kind of wages will be reasonable, et cetera. And of course, another key thing, which we will talk about next time, for the first time, the proclamation authorizes the enrollment of black men in the Union Army. There had been little experiments before that, but this is the first public <coughs> announcement by the government that black men will now be allowed to enroll in the Union Army. And that, I think, is one of the key reasons he drops colonization telling people to join the army and fight and die for the nation is a different concept than telling them to get out of the country. And I think one, we will see, once blacks are in the army, Lincoln's whole view of the role of African Americans in American life, I think, begins radically to change. The Confederacy denounced the proclamation, as you would imagine. The Richmond Examiner called it the most startling political crime known in American history. Davis denounced it as an act unknown even among barbarians. Davis liked to talk about barbarians alike. He, he, every time he criticized Lincoln, he called him a barbarian. Um, the main point is just simply this. The proclamation altered the character, fun, fundamentally changed the character of the Civil War. It didn't free the slaves at that moment. It made the, it joined the aim of emancipation to the aim of union. It meant, as I said, that if the North won the war, slavery would undoubtedly perish. So did emancipation come slowly? A lot of people say, oh, look how slow Lincoln was. Uh, that's absurd in my view. In the, view of, in the long view of history, this was tremendous southern, suddenness, 18 months. That's not a long time. After the beginning of the war, the general emancipation, not just the emancipation of some, as in the British, the general emancipation of most of the slaves of the South is proclaimed by the Union. Um, I think one of the best comments on this is, was by Karl Marx, writing for the, Herald, the New York Tribune back then from London. I quote this in my book. Up to now, we have witnessed the first act of the war, 
the constitutional waging of war. The second act, the revolutionary waging of war, is now at hand. In other words, the war has become a revolution, says Marx. What he means is it now pre presages the destruction of the ruling class of the South, a complete change in the nature of social relations in the South and perhaps in the nation. So the proclamation, in a sense, in some sense closes the question of slavery, but it opens up all these other questions that will continue long after the Civil War is over. What is freedom? What is equality? What, how to manage a multiracial society? Um, and those issues will continue to be debated in the Civil War, as I say, and long afterwards. So next time we will look at the role of black troops and how they come to reinforce the proclamation.